We, uh, we thought about the different orders of this, and I figured that we might ought, ought to keep Captain Ralph Stanley up to last year. He's one of the better known builders around here, and he's one of the better known historians. He's also a trustee of the museum and does a few other things. Okay, without any further ado, Ralph. Okay. Uh, you often hear the question, what is a friendship sloop? Wilbur Moss said the friendship sloop is a sloop built in friendship by Wilbur Moss. <laughs> in a way, he was right. However, when Wilbur Moss was building sloops, these boats were not called friendship sloops. They were called sloop boats, or in Down East dialect, sloop boats. Sometimes they were called yard boats or yard sloop boats. In fact, sloop boats were built all over the main coast, not only in friendship. Uh, I talked with a lady one time and she kept referring to <coughs> Frenchman sloops. And I wondered <laughs> what, what in the world is she talking about? And finally it dawned on me she meant friendship sloops. Uh, models of these sloops varied in, from area to area, just as modern lobster boats do today. Indeed, these sloops were the lobster boats of yesterday. When lobster fishing on the main coast became a viable occupation after 1856, much of the work was done in what was called a centerboard boat. These boats were usually open boats of lapstrick construction, about 15 feet long, and rigged with a mainsail and a jib. During this period, many of the lobster fishermen varied their occupation by shipping out on schooners engaged in purse seining mackerel. Most of the mackerel schooners owned on the main coast hailed from Portland. And of these, many were owned at Booth Bay Harbor and many at Swans Island. A great many vessels in this fleet of schooners, not owned in Maine, came from Gloucester. Gloucester. Mackerel schooners needed large crews, and at times not enough men could be secured in Gloucester, so men from Maine were often in great demand. The mackerel schooners were generally of the clipper model, carrying a lot of sail, and they were fast, there being great competition in getting the catch to market for the better price. These schooners had great initial stability, but could be driven to a point where they would capsize. So consequently, they had to be sailed very carefully. The lobster fishermen from Maine who shipped out on these schooners soon realized the advantage of having a larger sloop than their centerboard boats. They developed a sloop following the model of the Clipper Schooners. Due to the higher center of effort of the sloop rig, the models of the Schooners were modified slightly by widening the model and uh, retaining the centerboard of the old centerboard sloops. These sloops were half-decked with an open cockpit and were much more seaworthy than the smaller open centerboard boats. Many of these early sloops still retained the lapstrick construction of the centerboard boats. This was the beginning of what we now call the St. Muscongas Bay Sloop. Building these boats was not confined to Muscongas Bay. They were built all along the coast of Maine. I know of some that were built at Gotts Island off Mount Desert. As a young man, Wilbur Moss shipped out on a mackerel schooner. He kept a journal describing the events of the cruise, and I believe That, that is Wilbur Moss. That's, uh, okay. That's Wilbur Moss. And I believe that is the picture that appeared in the Christian Science Monitor. Now, they didn't approve of his pipe. 
<laughs> so they had to have the picture doctored up to take his pipe away. <laughs> uh, the next picture is, uh, I believe, Robert McLean. Um, he was uh, he was Wilbur Moss's brother-in-law, I believe. Now he also shipped out in macro schooners, and uh, another man, George Melville McLean, was born and grew up in Bremen, Maine, and he may have been a cousin of Robert A. McLean. As a young man, George shipped out and spent most of his life on schooners at Gloucester. He was a high-line fisherman, and he became master of many schooners. He also cut the models for many schooners, and it is known that over 100 vessels were built from his models. He may have cut models for sloops for some of his kin kinfolks back in Bremen, for there is a great similarity in the lines of his schooners and the lines of McLean sloops. If not, the same eye for a model ran in the McLean family. It has been said that Wilbur Moss borrowed Robert A. McLean's molds and patents to build his first sloop. As the models of the mackerel schooners improved and became deeper and more seaworthy vessels, so did the models of the sloop boats. For Muscongas Bay sloops, like the Clipper schooners, could be driven to a point of, of capsizing. The sloops became larger and deeper, and the centerboard was phased out. Although in the 1890s, Wilbur Moss was still building a centerboard sloop if you wanted one. Many of the larger, larger sloops were deck boats. It has been said that the main sloop boats were copied from the Gloucester sloop boats, but I believe this is not so. Looking at the list of merchant vessels of the United States, I have found that many of the sloops hailing from Gloucester were built in Maine. <laughs> I consider the true Gloucester sloop boat to be a much heavier vessel built with sawn frames, while the main boats were built with steam bent frames. Sloops were built all along the main coast, Bremen, Friendship, Bristol, Booth Bay, Thomaston, Rockland, Vinyl Haven, Owlsboro, Camden, Castine, Brooksville, Deer Isle, Swans Island, Bass Harbor, as, many, as well as many other places. Wilbur Moss at Friendship, in partner with his brother Jonah, became the most prolific builder of sloops on the coast. And that is probably why the sloops later became known as friendship sloops. Models of the sloops varied in certain particulars, from builder to builder and area to area. Builders may have been influenced by sloop yachts from the westward that cruised main waters, or they, may, or they had been seen when macro fishing to the westward, hence the term yacht boat. Swan's Island builders seem to favor narrower and deeper models. Now that is the Reliance built at Swan's Island, and that picture was taken in 1939. Uh, is there another one? Yeah, that's the Reliance there at the same time. Uh, they get quite a crowd of people aboard. <laughs> I don't think the man sailing I had a license to sail passengers. I <laughs> uh, don't know if you needed one then, but uh, <laughs> she did have a motor, so she was classed as a motor boat, but uh, uh, the boat may have been chartered by a family and then they hired the man to sail the boat. He didn't need a license in that case. Um, The friendship builders uh, had a wider model, but uh, they would change their models to suit the needs and preferences of individual owners. Just as I have changed my lobster boat models to suit individual fishermen. 
This interaction between builder and owner has always been an important factor in the develop, uh, development of better boats. Uh, next one. That is the friendship sloop Alma, owned by Abe Gilpatrick of Northeast Harbor, and she had a centerboard. Uh, later she was sold, and the new owners decided they would take the centerboard out and build it build it deeper. Uh, she never sailed as well after that. These sloops were not at all perfect boats, and builders were constantly seeking ways to improve their models. I have talked with men who fished from sloops, and one thing that I learned was that some sloops would drag their sterns under when sailed hard. Apparently, when heeled over, the boat did not have enough buoyancy in the afterbody aft, and that, together with the forward motion of the boat, would tend to drag the stern underwater. Once this happened, it would be hard to get the boat up into the wind. If the stern is too buoyant when heeled, the bow tends to go down and create a weather helm. Cliff Robbins of Southwest Harbor had a sloop named the Alice G. And she had such a weather helm that he had to rig a tackle on the tiller to steer her. <laughs> A lot of sloops had faults, but many balanced very well. Richie Stanley of Cranberry Island had a sloop named the Alice Marion, built at Hatchet Cove, Friendship, Maine, by Charles Moss in 1908, with a round bow. Fishing with a crew of three, they would be offshore for several days. When they got ready to sail home, they would trim the sails drop the tiller in the comb, and let her sail herself while they went below to play cards. <laughs> they look out now and then to check their course. Here again is the influence of the fishing schooner design in the round bow sloop, as opposed to the clipper bow. The knockabout schooner with a round bow was developed to do away with the bowsprit where so many men were washed overboard. Sloops were also built without a bowsprit, but it was generally found that they needed a short bowsprit to make the rig balance properly. These round bow sloops had a fuller water line forward than the clipper bow sloops, while the water line was usually sharper and a little hollow. In talking to some of the old fishermen who owned and sailed sloops, I get the impression that the main sloops were that the McLean sloops were consistently well-built boats. Some of the Moss sloops were just as well built, but I think some were not. Maybe they were built to fit the owner's pocketbook. One feature of sloop construction that gave the boats a lot of strength was the longitudinal plank scarfed together under the deck, planking on each side. Someone compared to this to, to a boat with three keels. This was good as long as the deck seams did not leak. If they did leak, this plank was prone to rot quickly. One notorious source of, of hull leaks was the well for the rudder post. This was a hard place to keep tight, especially when the boat got a little age. McLean sloops had a floor timber fitted and fastened to the planking. It was also fastened to the stern post, which formed the forward structural member of the rudder post well. This gave a slo the sloop a lot more strength in that area. The sharp tuck in the planking at the stern post was another source of leaks, as the frames often broke when bent around this sharp curve. The typical method of stepping the mast directly into the top of the keel rather than using a mast step on top of several floor timbers to spread the load was another weakness of the sloops. When sailed hard, there was tremendous downward pressure on the keel, as well as sideways, tending to open up the garbage seams. 
The elliptical transom with its sharp rake and camber is thought by some to be hard to build. However, once the builder has mastered the job, they are not so hard to do. I think many of the old builders built the transom by eye, judging from some of the old sloops that I have rebuilt. <coughs> the elliptical transom really had a purpose. It eliminated the otherwise scrap corners where the main sheet could get caught during a jibe. Not a good situation to be in. Fishermen wanted a steady boat with an easy motion, and they ballasted their sloops heavily. A lot of fishermen filled their sloops full of rocks up to the standing platform. Even those with outside iron keels also had a lot of rocks of pig iron added. Sloops ballasted with rocks would roll deeper but would have a slower, easier motion, while sloops with outside iron would not roll so deep, but they would have a quicker motion. Sometimes they would roll with such a, such a sharp snap as to take you off your feet. These sloops, uh, next. These sloops were not really built to last very long. Uh, most fishermen subjected their boats to pretty rough use. And you can see this one frozen in the ice. And you can imagine the bilge had water, and that was probably frozen solid too. And that was hard on a boat. The ice would expand a lot. Um, the galvanized nails used for fastenings um, would last about 20 years. And by the time the nails had ru were rusted out, there would be some serious rock problems in the wood. Most fishermen did not keep their boats that long. I think we have more. Yeah. And another one. Yeah, that, that is the boat under sail. Uh, now you see the pipe sticking out over the stern. That's the exhaust pipe for the engine. And of course, when the engine run, that would get pretty hot. Uh, most fishermen did not keep their boats that long enough to, to have a problem. Uh, those who did faced a major rebuilding project. Charles Richardson, this is the next one of Southwest Harbor, of, of Cranberry Island actually, had his sloop built in 1904. Now this picture is in Southwest Harbor, and that is my great uncle, Lou Stanley, sailing here, and um, that, the people are from the Appalachian Mountain Club. Now, Captain Richardson was sometimes known to be indisposed. Uh, he drank a little bit. And uh, it's possible that he was indisposed that day and my great uncle was, was sailing the boat for him. <laughs> Another thing you notice in this picture is the balanced jib. And that was a big help hauling lobster traps. You could come about quicker with that jib. Um, Charles Richardson had, a, had a, his boat rebuilt by Chester Clement at Southwest Harbor, I think, in 1931. And this picture was taken in 1939. Uh, some of the builders around Muscongas Bay would build a sloop in the winter, use it fishing that season, and sell it in the fall. Next winter, they would build another and repeat the cycle. Some of the McLeans often did this. Perhaps by using the boat one season, they would see a way to improve the next one. This is the way builders from the first have refined and improved their models and building methods. With every boat that I have ever built, I have found ways to improve the next one. Today's builders using fiberglass molds cannot change their model without making another expensive mold. The next boat has to be just like the first one. 
Some people call this progress. <laughs> it is interesting to note that not one of the fiberglass dictator sloops built by Jarvis Newman has ever outsailed the wooden dictator in a race. Now, uh, friendship sloop races, <coughs> it was not something new. Many of the fishermen in the 1890s and early 1900s fixed their fishing sloops up with new paint and varnish and sailed rusticators in the summer before lobstering and fishing in the fall. Where there, wherever there was a summer colony, sailing in sloops was a po popular pastime. Many families would engage a fisherman with his sloop for the whole summer season, and many did this year after year. Fishermen were pretty skillful sailors, and the summer people were quite impressed by the way they could sail their sloops to a dead stop at the dock or at the mooring, and the way they handled their sloops in difficult situations. It was considered great sport to sponsor races among the sloops. The following account from the Bar Harbor Record of August 28, 1907, is of a sloop race off Northeast Harbor. The annual race for sloops owned in and around Northeast Harbor by the year-round residents was sailed Saturday in wind enough to make it interesting. Though they had to beat it out on the first leg of the course, which was from Northeast Harbor, to the whistling buoy off Baker's Island, then to the Red Spa buoy, Western Way, and back to Northeast, a distance of eight and one half miles. There were two classes, large and small sloops, <laughs> over 30 feet and under 30 feet. Cash prizes and pennants were offered by the summer colony. Eight large and four small sloops entered. In the large class, the alert, Captain W.D. Stanley of Cranberry won the $10 first prize in pennant. W.D. Stanley was my great uncle, and I now live in the house that he built in Southwest Harbor. Uh, Captain Freeman Gort, that's Lewis Freeman Gort, won the $10 first prize in pennant. With, uh, oh no, W.D. Stanley won the $10 first prize in pennant with Captain Freeman Gort second, $5 in pennant. Uh, Freeman Gort sloop was a centerboard sloop. The Louise A., Captain Ernest Sperling, was third with $3. In the small class, the Columbia, Captain Henry Sperling of Southwest Harbor took first prize, $10 in pennant. The next two were Les, Les Prince, owned by Lewis Stanley Cranberry. Now, this boat, I believe, is the one that <coughs> Lewis Stanley, my great uncle, and his brother went down to Bristol and bought. They, they started rowing on a dory for, for Bristol from Cranberry Island, and um, they were picked up by a fisherman bound to the westward and dropped off off the town of Bristol and rowed in, got the sloop, and sailed her home. <laughs> um, the, this boat was sailed by Captain Bill Black. Uh, and the Nellie Francis, Captain Fred Sperling of Osford. There were two other Osford entries. The Mary Alice, under 30 feet, Captain George Henry Sperling. The Helen, Captain Arthur Joy. The Rover's Bride, Captain Harvey Bolger, the Defender, Captain Freeman Stanley, and the Seagull, Captain Fred A. Burlam. It was a top race, and if the wind was fluky at the start, the boat finished in a wholesale breeze. These working sloops were delightful to sail, and they soon became popular with the summer folks as a pleasure boat. Many summer families on the island of Penobscot Bay owned sloop boats for their convenience and pleasure. At Eagle Island in East Penobscot Bay for a number of years, 
A sloop boat race was organized each year with trophies awarded to the winners. These were working boats that came from all over the main coast to enter the race, sort of like the lobster boat races of today. The Tremont Historical Society has a cup won by Lewis Raymond Gort for winning the Eagle Island race for three years in, in succession. He got to keep the cup. <laughs> Captain Freeman Gort's sloop was named Mary Wings and was a centerboard sloop. I believe he built this boat himself, possibly at, at Gort's Island or Bass Harbor, I don't know which. After, even after sloops ceased to be useful as a working boat, interest remained and a few survived the ravages of time. They were kept in repair and sailed by a few dedicated people who appreciated their good looks and good sailing qualities. They were an all-around handy boat. I think that's words that Roger Duncan said. Uh, the Penobscot Marine Museum for many years had a sloop named Truant on display until she deteriorated so badly she had to be dismantled. She had sailed many years on Penobscot Bay. Voyager, built by Charles Moss at Friendship in 1902, was one of those survivors sitting in a boatyard at Onset, Massachusetts. In 1951, Bernard McKenzie and a partner became her owners. Later, the partner dropped out and Bernie became the sole owner. In 1960, Mackenzie ended her in the Boston Power Squadron race for auxiliaries at Marblehead. She was hopelessly outclassed by 16 large Marconi Ridge sloops and a few ocean races. With a gale of wind, northeast, now you notice I say northeast, not northeast, as some people think. Uh, you always say northeast, southeast, southwest, or Norwest. And uh, you see a lot of times in the, in the newspapers they'll say a nor Nor'easter, and that's not right, it's a Northeaster. <laughs> um, but anyway, the gale of wind, Northeast, and heavy choppy seas with white caps all around. And despite having a split jib, during the race and having to set another on Voyager, the modern boats had more trouble sailing on their beam ends and dragging spinnakers in the water. Voyager sailed at hull speed, gained a half mile ahead of the fleet and won the race. From this, Mackenzie was encouraged to organize a homecoming regatta for friendship sloops at Friendship Harbor. Through the efforts, together with John Gould, Roger Duncan, and others from Friendship. The Friendship Sloop Society was formed and the first regatta was held at Friendship on July 22, 1961 with 14 sloops. From this beginning, the event grew to a three-day regatta to perpetuate the interest in sailing a sloop and to honor those who, who have kept the tradition alive. In 1961, I was captain of the 43-foot schooner Nilaraga owned by Mrs. Florence Montgomery at Northeast Harbor. When she was a teenager, her mother, Mrs. Gailey, with her two sisters, summered at Harborside Inn at Northeast Harbor. While there, Mrs. Gailey chartered for the summer a friendship sloop sailed by Captain Richardson and it's this sloop right here. And um, now, Captain Richardson, as I've said, was a character, and at times he could consume quite a lot of rum. He also had a reputation as an agitator. He liked to get people going. Uh, however, no one could compare with him in sailing a sloop. One day the girls asked Captain Richardson to sail them to Blue Hill in the sloop. Captain Richardson reasoned that he was hired to do their bidding without question, but he didn't tell them it would take them almost all day. 
When I didn't get back, Mrs. Gailey was terribly concerned, and someone asked, who is your captain? She said, Captain Richardson. She was assured that the girls would be all right. It took them more than half the night to get back. In the early 1900s, it was a shocking situation for three young girls by themselves to be out on a boat with the captain for half the night. Of course, Captain Richardson knew this, and it tickled him to stir people up. <laughs> In the summer of 1961, Mrs. Montgomery heard about the event at Friendship, and knowing that I was about to build a sloop for Alvin Nelson that winter, that's the Hieronymus that I built for Alvin Nelson. Uh, she's in, in frame, partly flying. She knew that I was going to have to, to build a sloop for Alvin Nelson that winter. She suggested cruising to Friendship. It had been years since so many sloops had been gathered in one place all at once. I think we have another. Yeah, that's, uh, that's around us in the race at Friendship. The uh, Friendship Sloop Societies became an annual event at Friendship with three days of racing and other activities where sloop owners got to show off their boats and share experiences. The society, I think we have another one. No, that's, that's all right. The, the society has been responsible for reviving much interest in the Friendship Sloop. Okay. And many old sloops have been rebuilt and many new sloops have been built, both in wood and also in fiberglass. That is uh, Gladiator, I believe, right after she was rebuilt. And that's the owner, Bill Zuba, and his wife, Caroline. Uh, I'm not sure who the other fellow is, but... And... Yeah, that's Gladiator there. Another one. I'm not sure whether this is Gladiator or Chrissy, but it could be Chrissy, but I'm not sure. They both had white trail boards, and uh, I can't tell. It may be Chrissy. But anyway, um, uh, let's have the next one. Oh, okay, that's Phil Nichols. He, he built some new sloops. And uh, uh, go back to Phil. No, go go ahead to Phil Nichols, and uh, and another one I think. Yeah, that's secret. Uh, after she was built for the master step, uh, he built a number of sloops. Uh, he built Surprise, and he built Monument Success, and I can't remember the others. Um, my shop has rebuilt four old sloops and built 13 new sloops ranging from 16 feet to 36 feet in length, all based on the Friendship hull shape. Uh, Bruno Stillman of New Hampshire built a number of fiberglass sloops and Jarvis Newman built a great many fiberglass sloops. Let's have another one. No, go ahead. Oh, no. Well, okay, that, that's, uh, that was Harvey Gamage, and this is his boat, built new. He was inspired to build a new sloop. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's Morning Star. That's a sloop that I rebuilt, an old one, 28-footer, but together with Sazerac. It looks like Sazerac is overtaking her. Now, in the... Oh, let's go to the next one. Okay, that's the dictator. Uh, when Chesney owned her at Deer Isle, and he used to sail the sloop all the way around Deer Isle once a year with a bunch of people. I hope they had life preservers enough. <laughs> uh, Last Brothers at Friendship built a number of new, new friendship sloops also. Um, 
And Jarvis built a number of sloops on the, on the uh, uh, Pemaquid model and also on the Dictator model. I uh, rebuilt the Dictator for Jarvis Newman and also I, we took one of his fiberglass Dictator hulls into my shop and built a deck on it so that he could take the mold off the deck so we'd have a deck mold. And um, it's awfully hard to work inside a fiberglass boat. A wooden boat, you can walk up on the side and, and you've got some traction under your feet. But you try to walk up on the side of a, inside of a fiberglass sloop, you slide right down back in the bottom again. And uh, I always said if I did another deck on a sloop like that, I'd fill the boat full of sand or gravel <laughs> so I'd have something to stand on. And then when we get it done, I could just shovel the gravel out and pump it out or something. <laughs> now, the, the last year that the regatta was held at Friendship, uh, maybe I got another dictator picture. Uh, no, yeah, that's dictator number two, right? And is there another one? That's dictator. I believe it's Stonington when she was a working boat. Uh, the last year that the regatta was held at Friendship, there were 53 boats, and the event came, became too big for the harbor. Then the regatta was moved to Booth Bay Harbor, where for three years in a row, I won the Class A division, sailing the sloop Morning Star. Originally built by Albion Moss at Cushing, that I had rebuilt for Robert Wolfe. There was a gale of wind all three days. What's that? Who didn't know how to sail. Oh, yeah, he didn't know how to sail. You know, the person that he picked to sail the boat had never sailed a boat in his life, and he sailed, he sailed that race all the way. <laughs> Next day, he, he wouldn't sail again. <laughs> it scared him, so. Uh, the first uh, race that I sailed in Booth Bay in Morningstar was with a double reef mainsail. There was a gale of wind all three days for all three years. Now, the... I, in that first race, I was the last to cross the fish, finish, uh, last to cross the starting line, and the first to finish. It blew so hard that all I could do was concentrate on sailing around the course as best I could. I was surprised when I got the cannon at the finish. Bruce Morang was of the race committee said that was the greatest comeback he had ever seen. The regatta is now held at Rockland and brings out 20 to 30 sloops. At present, I think 281 sloops are registered with the Friendship Sloop Society. And for 150 years or more, Friendship Sloops have been present on Penobscot Bay, and the Friendship Sloop and its members are largely, the Friendship Sloop Society and its members are largely responsible for the fact that they can still be seen sailing here today. Uh, Rockland Harbor had a large fleet of sloops engaged in, in dredging, dredging scallops during the season. In the days before engines, the dredge was towed under sail. But after the make and break engine became available, sloops were fitted with power and the towing was done under power. Howard Robbins was the light keeper at Rockland Breakwater. Howard was an old man, but this was a family light, and his son Clifford, together with Clifford's wife and two children, lived at the lighthouse. The fog signal was powered by a large stationary engine with an eight-foot flywheel. And in order to start the engine, one had to walk up the, on the spokes to get the flywheel turning and then jump off when the engine fired. <laughs> now, you had to be pretty nimble to do that. Uh, Clifford had a sloop boat and he wanted to go scalloping because the, the old man, Howard, couldn't, 
couldn't start the engine, and uh, so he taught his wife how to start the engine. <laughs> now, she had to demonstrate to the lighthouse inspector that she could start the engine in order that Clifford could have permission to go scalloping. So he did, he got permission to go scalloping. He got permission to go scalloping, and uh, things worked pretty good until one day she started the engine and had dress tail caught in the flywheel. And it flipped her head over heels. And I don't know if she landed on her feet or not, but uh, she was a rugged woman and didn't get hurt. Uh, Rockland sloops would drag scallop beds in West Penobscot Bay, and often they would go into East Penobscot Bay. Whenever they stopped at Southwest Harbor on Deer Isle, it was a ritual that the fishermen had to call on Aunt Salome Sellers, who was nearly 100 years old. Somehow it was reasoned that calling on her would bring them good luck. It must have been a sight to see all these rough fishermen who had been living on their sloops, and this is in the wintertime, and hadn't washed or changed their clothes for a week or more, calling on this frail little old lady. It seems she received them gracefully and always had gave them some words of wisdom. Her house is now headquarters of the Deer Isle Historical Society. Sloops were used not only for fishing, but also for transportation and freight. A man from Goolsboro, after getting a job at Rockland, hired two men with a sloop to go to Goolsboro and bring his wife and family, along with their household furnishings, back to Rockland. I think it was three children in the family, two boys and a girl. And uh, it was a two-day two trip from Goolsboro with a stop at Southwest Harbor on Mount Desert Island while the passengers stayed overnight with friends and relatives. The next day, they got to North Haven at dark, and it took them all night to sail from the Fox Island thoroughfare to Rockland. Now, the, the men who had the, boat, had the sloop, they had an engine, but they didn't have much gas, and they were saving it for an emergency, a real dire emergency, so they wouldn't start the engine unless they had to. It took them all night to sail across the bay to Rockland. And uh, it was the last day of the year, and uh, the night was clear and cold with not much wind. The men sailing the sloop were dressed warm, and the passengers below in the cabin were warm and snug with the cabin stove. They were quite impressed with the sight of the fires of the lime kilns along the Rockland Rockport shores, something that will never be seen again. The two men spent the winter aboard the, that sloop tied to a dock in Rockland Harbor. Uh, several years ago, Bill Zuba, who, uh, let's have another picture of Gladiator, Gladiator, right There's there. Bill. Uh, on the, on the okay, Bill Zuba was sailing his sloop Gladiator in the western way of Southwest Harbor, and not realizing how far a ledge made out off the seawall shore, he got aground. The tide was high, but it just started to go and Gladiator was hard to ground. Couldn't get her off under her own power. So he called the Coast Guard. But as there was no, no life in danger, they would not assist. However, Zuba got all the people, including a little baby in the rowboat, and set them ashore in a private dock nearby where they could call for someone to pick them up. As the tide was going, Gladiator was fast laying over on her side. They got a cushion between the bilge and the ledge, and she laid there all night long, waiting for high tide at about 3 o'clock in the morning. The morning tides generally do not come as high in, as, as the afternoon or night tides, and Gladiator did not float enough to get off on her own power. Now, I had just had a 
had two stents put in my arteries, my heart arteries, in addition to two that I had already had, in addition to a quadruple bypass <laughs> before that. Uh, I really didn't want to get out, but uh, about three o'clock in the morning, Bill called me on his cell phone. And to ask if I could help. Well, what could I do? It was thick of fog and pitch black dark. And when I got aboard Seven Girls, I, I cast off the mooring and felt my way out amongst the boats on moorings in the harbor. In the process, I had hit my hand on something and thought no more about it until I noticed that the throttle was awfully sticky. I got the flashlight to see what was going on and found that my hand was bleeding all over everything. Uh, so I got some paper towels to wrap my hand and then with the GPS got out to where Gladiator was aground amongst all the boats on the moorings. And um, Hal Burner, Burnham, owner of Chrissy, was there and we pulled Gladiator's anchor to use the rope for a tow line. That was about a, a half inch line, I think, that he had her anchored with. And by this time, the tide was going, and Gladiator's water line, her rudder was over a foot out of water, probably a foot and a half. And I thought it would be useless to try, but I gradually kept increasing the power until the tow line was stretched to about half its diameter. All the time, I expected it was going to part when Gladiator started to move and came off with no damage. By this time it was daylight and the fog had started to lift. Alexander McLean of Bremen was the builder of Gladiator in the year 1902. Now, uh, Bill had, had rebuilt her and, um, and that's years after being rebuilt. I can't remember how many years ago it was he rebuilt her, but uh, she was still pretty solid <laughs> to stand all that. Uh, we have some more pictures, I think. Uh, that is a watercolor done by Paul Stubing. Uh, L.B. Nelson de, uh, de, uh, commissioned that, uh, Paul to do that painting. It's, uh, it's off Eagle Island in East Penobscot Bay. And um, it shows a friendship sloop off the island. And I can't remember what sloop he said that was, but uh, it was an original sloop that he told me he met, he drew a picture of. Um, that is here at the museum. Okay, next one. That is a, a picture in Carver's Harbor uh, showing some friendship sloops. And it also shows a three master. I don't know what they're there for, maybe the load stone. Uh, next one. That's at Hatchet Cove. And is that the Stanley L, maybe? Probably. Yeah. It's in the same batch of stuff as Stanley L. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's next. Next one. Oh, that is uh, in the Friendship Museum. Uh, next. Okay, Sazerac is the one on the left. Now she was rebuilt by Jim Rockefeller at Camden. I think she came out a little bit longer than she originally was. Uh, somebody said, asked him what they wanted to do with the stern. He said, cut it off. So they took a chainsaw and cut it right off and they had to uh, kind of guess at what the transom was originally when they put it back. I think they got it a little bit longer. Uh, we got another one. Okay, that is uh, Peregrine, what the dark hall. And Eastwood is overtaking her. I guess that's in one of the races at Friendship. Uh, 
I think I have the wheel. I think that's the owner sitting on the stern. Uh, she was a, a copy of the Amos Swan that I had. had uh, I took the Amos Swan in to rebuild for Ed Calver, and she was so out of shape that I, I, uh, I couldn't do anything with it. So we ended up sawing the boat up and saving the hardware and what we could off of the boat, could use. Uh, I, took, I had taken the lines off the venture that I had rebuilt for Jarvis Newman at one time, and um, I used the venture's lines and sort of adapted them to the dimensions of the Amos Swan and uh, designed a new boat. And uh, I built the new boat, and she was named the Amos Swan. And, uh, and uh, after a few years, Kelp was sold to a man in, in Camden. And he had the boat for sale himself, and then he sailed her down to Nantucket and back, and uh, decided he'd keep her. But he had her on a mooring in Camden Harbor, with not a very big mooring line, and come up quite a storm. And she went ashore on those rocks by Wayfarer, and uh, she's still piecey. Um, but Peregrine was built on the same model as that boat. Now, I, I built a boat for myself named the Endeavor on those same lines, but I shortened her up a little bit. And that boat's still sailing out of Southwest today. Uh, next picture. That is the chance. Uh, I think she's an old Mars sloop, and uh, I remember back in the early 50s, a man named uh, Guy Clawson had a, a Northeast Harbor sailing parties. And um, then I, later on, uh, I have a picture of her in Union River on the uh, Union River Bay, where she went ashore in a, in a storm. And there she is laying on her side, but they got her off all right. And and uh, I think she was rebuilt at, um, <coughs> I can't remember, uh, in Brooksville somewhere. And um, she now owned by the Maine Maritime Museum. Um, Let's go to the next one. Oh, that is, uh, that is Freedom, the white boat. Uh, I built her for, for Richard Dudman, who at that time owned WDEA radio in Elza. Uh, she's quite a fast boat. She has a long boom. Uh, Full-size friendship rig. She's 28 feet long. Uh, at present, she's she's for sale. Um, there's another one. Okay, this is an old picture showing at Monhegan, showing a lot of friendship sloops and. Uh, uh, I think if you look sharp there, you'll see some some centerboard boats, but I'm not sure. That's just the picture's not clear enough. Um, is that the last one? Oh no, this is uh, this is Dolphin. That's a she's a Wilbur sloop, owned at uh, Little Cranberry Island by Archie Sperling, and. Um, Archie Spilling had a great tenor voice, and sometimes you could hear him singing over the water uh, as he was sailing along. Uh, he just picked up some people at the Claremont Hotel in 1939, and he was sailing out by Greenings Island inside the ledge where the buoy is. So many people mistake that buoy and go around on that ledge, but he knew where to go. Uh, that was a series of pictures taken by Bill Ballard. 
Uh, the first picture I think shows him picking the people up at Claremont Docks. Yeah, another one. Okay, this is in my shop, and I'm not sure what boat this is, but it shows the keel set up and uh, the deadwood and shark log uh, set up in the background. My son Richard is working on the keel and I think I'm standing there and my grandson Adrian Goodwin is next to him, next to me. Uh, next one. Now this is an unidentified sloop. Um, I think I got that from the museum here quite a while ago, but I don't know what, what sloop it is. It might be one from South Brooksville, but I'm not sure. Okay, this is a sloop, by, a picture by Ballard, taken at Blue Hill in 1939. And he had it labeled Defender. Now, it looks, I've seen pictures, and I've seen the, the sloop uh, White Eagle that belonged to Bob Montana. And uh, the last time I saw her, she was in a, a barn down in Newcastle, uh, or in a shelter down in Newcastle. And uh, that looks like the same boat. But uh, I didn't have this picture with me, so I really couldn't tell. But it looked like the same boat. Notice there's no trail boards on there. And uh, so I don't know. Um, I never figured it out. Okay, that is the Sky Pilot. Now, is she a McLean sloop? Yes. Okay, it looked like one. Yeah, that is, uh, I believe, Richard's Cove <coughs> in Isle of Hull. Yeah, and another one, George Sloops. These are all pictures of Paul Sloop and collecting. Yeah, and uh, that one in the Isle of Hull thoroughfare. See how, see how the islands were cut over in those days. There again, uh, that's how rough they used their sloops. Uh, service boats over with fodder for the uh, for the animals that were that were uh, starving basically. But, but that uh, we know um, I think it was 1918 or thereabouts the bay froze over pretty hard that year. I think that's about it as far as as far as yeah, there yeah we go. okay. Now uh, some of these sloops were built with round bow and some of them even had plumb stems. The alert that one of the race at Northeast Harbor had a plumb stem. She was quite a big sloop. I think she was 38 feet. And um, I'm not sure where she was built, but I think maybe in Bristol or Booth Bay. Um, and I, in, the, in Southwest Harbor, there's a, there's a a, a big picture that has been enlarged on the wall of the post office, and it shows some sloops off the Manchet shore. And one of, the, one of those sloops is a smaller sloop and has a plumb bow. Uh, so they were built all kinds of ways, with flipper bows and round bows and plumb bows. And that's pretty much what I got to say.
Any, any questions? Hey. Yeah. Uh, in, in a couple of the pictures where you had uh, a couple of boats sailing against each other with the racing, uh, it looked like one had the, had the gaff peaked up quite a bit more than the other. Uh, I don't know, couldn't tell whether that was a camber angle or was there you know, different rigs or is that the way people set up or what was the preferred way to do that? Well, some of the some of the people had uh, had the peaks up higher. They they thought that uh, they had the sails cut with a higher peak to to gain more advantage going to windward. But I don't know whether they did or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, during the the race at Booth Bay, where I won the races three years in a row, that was a, in all three days. Um, one race I was. Uh, I had a, a cameraman from, I think, to Sail Magazine aboard, and um, about the time I put the cockpit rail under, <laughs> and Marion ruined her watch, her wristwatch, I, uh, when she came up again, I said to the cameraman, did you get a picture of that? Oh, I said, I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they, they did. The, the working boats had topsails in the summer. Uh, I don't know if they... Yeah, they had fish. Uh, when they were fishing, they had topsails to get in quicker. But uh, a lot of times they didn't use the topsails. When they were hauling traps, they always put in a reef. And uh, they would uh, tie the reef points and uh, lash the... the, the uh, outer end to the boom with, with marlin so that they could just reach out with a knife and cut it when they took a reef out in order to come home. Now, my father's cousin, uh, his name was, I um, uh, can't think now, Edwin Stanley, I think. Uh, anyway, he, Edward Stanley, he, uh, he, uh, uh, without and finished hauling his traps, and he reached out to to cut the marlin. He was, he'd shaken out the reef, and that was the last thing he did was cut that marlin. And somehow the sea knocked him overboard, apparently, because they never found him. They noticed the sloop was sailing erratically, and the life-saving crew went out there, but the sloop was just, uh, the reef had been shaken out, but not pulled up, no one was aboard. So they never found him, but, um, uh, Another man got knocked overboard uh, from a sloop out off Duck Island, and um, the boom hit him and knocked him overboard, but he got back aboard all right. I don't know how. I think he had a man with him that helped him, but he got back aboard, but, uh, um, yeah. So when they're pulling possitos, they, would they, they leave the sail up over the reef in them and just go into irons while they're pulling the pot, or how would they work the sails? They'd leave the reef right in while they're hauling traps. I'm sorry? They'd leave the reef right, right in while they're hauling traps, and when they got ready to come home, they'd shake it out and pull the sail up, so they'd get home faster. Any other, any other questions? Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh,